Guillaume, we just got back from a conference. Uh, I watched two of your papers. What were those about? Well, they were about philosophical theology and on the issues surrounding God's providential control of human free choices. So discussing the relationship between determinism, free will, and moral responsibility. And as you can imagine, I was clenching the sides of my seat uh, when, when, when I was uh, listening to this. Uh, Guillaume, mm -hmm. after listening to your papers, it's clear that you have a lot to say on a lot of issues. You were, on a, you were, on a, you were in a series of presentations along with uh, William Lane Craig. Uh, so you clearly have a lot to say, but a lot of people are just going to be interested for now in how you became a Christian, because you were a French atheist. I guess you're, you're still French, yes, in, in a sense. Yes, I am. <laughs> that, that hasn't changed. Now, based on YouTube comments, anyone who believes in Christianity is really, really dumb. So you must uh, just believe what you're told to believe. You weren't very educated. Someone came along, told you a message. You couldn't think for yourself. And that's how you became a Christian. Is that, is that about right? It's not quite the story. There are some differences here and there, but... Uh, well, just, just what, was your, what was your educational background before, you know, as you were growing up? Yeah, so what I, it was clear from some of the earlier stages that I was much more scientifically inclined rather than literary or economic. So I went on to study um, math, physics, and engineering in college. I did some program in France that's called uh, a prep school. It's maths sup, maths pay. It's a very high pressure two-year preparation for the various prestigious engineering school called, it's called Classe Préparatoire aux Grandes Écoles. And basically it's two years of intense math physics to um, prepare you for a contest to enter into those prestigious schools. So I did that. I graduated in engineering science, in the computer science and I landed a job in computer science as a software developer in finance. Mm -hmm. And apart from education, what, 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 what was going on during this time? Well, I, at that time I was still, still an atheist and I was essentially trying to pursue my own happiness on all fronts. So I was pursuing this to obtain at least a stable position and a job. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, also playing at the time in a rock band. I was playing keyboard in a rock band and we were starting to French rock do band. various concerts. We okay. were singing in English, but we were French. And uh, the, the band was a lot of fun and I enjoyed playing with these guys. And uh, on the sports front, I also discovered that I could jump three feet high. And so since I'm six feet tall, they put me in a volleyball team and I ended up playing in National League. And, and I, I've, seen, I've seen the footage of you spiking. There's that shot of you coming up. Oh, and here's the net. And here's you rising above it. And everyone's way down there and you're just slamming it right over yeah, everyone. Those were good so, times. Yeah, good times, good times. And so I was pursuing my own happiness on all those fronts. There was the music, the sports and the, the job. And uh, on the front of uh, women conquest, at least uh, in France, uh, for a young atheist my age, one of the ideals was also to multiply feminine conquests. And I was starting to have enough success there to satisfy the raunchy standards of the volleyball locker room. So my life was doing pretty well on all those fronts and I was trying to be happy and doing a good job at it. So it sounds like you're sort of living the, the secular atheist dream, right? You're, you're, I wasn't complaining. You're, uh, you're, you're in sports. You're playing music, getting lots of girls. Something obviously happened to change your mind about things. So yeah. what, what's going on? Well, it was an unusual set of circumstances. I went on vacation with my older brother to the Caribbean in the island of St. Martin. Is he um, tall like you? Yes, he is. Okay. And he plays also volleyball. So okay. we went there together, essentially trying to have a good time with tropical weather, white sand, uh, turquoise blue water, and the occasional beach volleyball game. So mm -hmm. what's not to like? And given the ungodly amount of vacation that we have in France, we went there for three and a half weeks. Hmm. And during our stay over there, we one day went to a little bit of a distant beach. Um, and coming back from the beach, uh, for some reason, that day we decided to come back hitchhiking. I had never hitchhiked in my entire life until that day, and I have never done it ever since. But for some reason, it was decided we would hitchhike our way home. So we start hitchhiking, and uh, a few minutes after, there's a car that stops in there where there was two tourists, two women from the United States. One, from, one was from Miami, the other one was from New York. And they were actually not stopping to pick us up. They were stopping to ask for directions. Mm -hmm. And they were lost on their way from the airport to their hotel. As it turns out, the hotel or the airport were nowhere near the beach at which they, were, they came to pick us up. So they were clearly way lost. And here they were asking for directions. 
Now, they told us where they were going, we, and it turns out that their hotel was right next door to the house at which we were staying. So we told them, well, look, we're happy to tell you, just pick us up and we'll go there. So we get in and uh, they were attractive enough that uh, I started flirting and we were trying to see them again on the, on the island before we left. And it turned out that we did and I ended up dating the one who was in New York. And uh, I quickly found out though that uh, she was a professing Christian. She said that she believed in God, which in my own worldview at that time was pretty much an intellectual suicide. And also attached to that problematic belief was her belief that sex only belonged in marriage, which is even crazier than theism, if that was at all possible. So here we are now in this dist long distance relationship because I flew back to Paris, she flew back to New York, and here we were, and I, I essentially had religion standing in our way of being happy and together. So my new goal in life was to try to show her why her Christian beliefs were silly, mm -hmm. that she should put all this nonsense behind her, and why we should be happy together. And if I was going to be criticizing Christianity, at least I needed to know what Christianity teaches. And so I picked up a Bible and I started to read about Jesus. And what I found there was a little bit feeling and tasting differently than I had expected. What I saw in Jesus was a person who was speaking with authority mm -hmm. and he was maneuvering in conversation in ways that were pretty impressive. He was clearly, he knew what he was talking about and that started to put a little bit of an awkward uh, fact for me to handle. I knew that at some point I would need to have some account of who I thought this Jesus was. Mm -hmm. Because in, I, 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 I was the same way when, yeah. when, I, when, I, when I read, uh, uh, I, before I was a Christian, I read Matthew, Mark, and John. And uh, I was really impressed. I was really impressed when I read the words of, of, of Jesus for, for the, the same reasons you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and even at the time, even as an atheist, I never really bought into the whole Jesus myth theory. Mm -hmm. I, it never occurred to me that Jesus was a mythological figure in some sort of fairy tale. It seemed clear, at least minimally, that he was a historical person mm -hmm. who walked the roads of Palestine in the first century. Mm -hmm. And, so, and that, that, that's, that's another parallel, by the way, in that, in that when I was reading the Gospels, I'm thinking I'm actually reading uh, first century accounts of, uh, of, of the early church. And, you know, because you, you, you see all kinds of atheists nowadays on, you know, on YouTube and uh, they're so far away from scholarship, they have no clue what they're, what they're talking about, and that the genre of the Gospels is first century Greco-Roman right. biography. Mm -hmm. um, so we were on the same page there in that we're both taking this seriously as early, as early accounts of, of yeah. Jesus, Minimally which, which is historical. cool because that's, that's what scholarship uh, agrees on that's nowadays, right. so, so we were right. Without knowing we were actually on the right path. Mm -hmm. But also, it seems like his teachings were taken seriously enough and his impact on his disciples was such that they were prepared to say, I've seen this and I vouch for him. And also they were then testifying that they had seen him risen from the dead after his crucifixion. Mm -hmm. And they were ready to go to their graves for the truth of that belief. So at that point, I thought this is at least some set of events that I need to have an account for. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't really sure how I would resolve this, but I figured at some point I will need to give an account of who I thought Jesus mm -hmm. was. But I wasn't, no, I wasn't anywhere near changing my mind at this point. Uh, I couldn't even have ended up in church even if I wanted to because all of my weekends were busy traveling the country to play volleyball games. And so on Sunday mornings, I couldn't even have visited a church. The thing is that this barrier didn't last long because shortly after I started investigating those matters, my shoulder started to fail me. And your spiking uh, shoulder. Yes, the, okay. the, the, the shoulder of the arm for the spiking. And about 10 minutes into every volleyball practice, my shoulder burned and I just couldn't spike anymore. And so the doctor. And, that, and that's pretty much all you could do. That's on, right. On, since on, on, since on, I, oh, all I could yeah. do was jump, and you can't, if you can't spike and you're a middle blocker, yeah. you're pretty much worthless. Okay. So um, I was off of the volleyball court. The doctors couldn't find anything wrong with my shoulder. Uh, the physical therapist's best efforts didn't help. And I was basically told, look, you just need to rest your shoulder. You need to stop volleyball for an, a couple of weeks and see where it goes from there. So you need something to do for a couple of weeks. So against my will, I'm off of volleyball courts. And I figured, well, since I've been looking into this Christianity thing, I might as well go and see what those Christians do when they get together. So I got the address of an evangelical congregation in Paris. And on that first Sunday morning without a volleyball game, I took my car and I drove to that congregation. And the way I describe it is really that I went there like you would go to the zoo to see some weird exotic animals that you've heard about or read in books mm -hmm. but never seen in real life. And so I went there to just see what those weird animals do when they get together. 
And I walked into that church and I remember feeling oppressed by the, the clear knowledge that if any of my friends or family could see me there in a church, I would die of shame. And so the whole thing was really awkward and I was seeing these people and um, they looked like they genuinely believed what they were doing. They were praying and they thought that the God was literally hearing their prayers. So the whole thing was awkward for me and I sat down in the corner trying not to meet anybody and I listened to the preacher and to this day I don't remember a word that the preacher said I figured I've seen enough so I jumped to my feet and I walked to the back of the church trying to escape and being careful not to make eye contact so I wouldn't have to introduce myself to any of those weirdos and I reached the exit door at the back of the church opened it and I literally had one foot out the door when a blast of chills grabbed me in the stomach, going all the way in my chest and grabbed me by the throat. And I was frozen on the doorstep with goosebumps all over. A anything and like that ever happened before? Not quite. <laughs> and so, but you know, I, I was there frozen and I heard myself thinking, well, this is ridiculous. I have to figure this out. Mm -hmm. And so I closed the door in front of me, turned around and I went straight to the head pastor and said, so you believe in God, huh? He looked at me and said, yes said well how does that work out and he said we can talk about it and so he waited till everyone was gone and then we went to his office and he prayed for me which I thought was a bit awkward but at least it was reassuringly consistent at least he really believed his stuff and so then we started talking and we started to answer some of my question what is this Christianity thing and he he was a man who didn't have necessarily a formal training in apologetics or providing good arguments in favor of Christianity in the way that you and I now know too, but he had consistent answers within his own worldview and that was impressive in its own right. He was a man who clearly wasn't out of his mind. He was, uh, he thought on his feet and he was educated and yeah, he and, thought and, that God existed and that Jesus was raised from the dead. And, that, that, and that's important because uh, th this was a problem I had when I, when I ran into a Christian who actually knew what he was talking about that I, I was shocked, right? I, any discussion with a Christian should be a massacre, right? Should. I, I should just slaughter this person. Yeah. And so when, you, when, when I didn't, it was, what's, what's going on here, right? Because mm -hmm. I thought all of these guys were just complete morons and yes. here's someone who, who, who isn't. Yeah, and so I wasn't necessarily aggressive with that person, but I was trying to understand how these views make sense. And he just had coherent answers and he was essentially explaining me what Christianity is. So for a number of weeks after that, I just made appointments to come and talk with him and we just exchange on the ideas of Christianity. He tried to slowly walk me through the basics of Christianity, gave me a booklet that he had written that um, encouraged me to ask, that asked questions and pointed me to the Bible to see what the scriptures actually teach mm -hmm. on those matters and slowly but surely these various beliefs started to make sense to me um, a lot of Christianity started to have coherent sense but there's one that just didn't register I couldn't understand at all and I still have my written notes at home that's written in French about all of my studying on those matters every other page I've written this question that didn't make sense why did Jesus have to die mm -hmm. it made no sense to me why what was the connection between Jesus dying and my Christian life, if I were to become a Christian, I didn't see the connection. Mm -hmm. And very soon after, the answer would come. At that point, my unbelief had uh, slowed down a little bit and I was starting to shift my unbelieving prayer life into, God, this starts to make sense, but if you're real, I'm going to need to have you really explicitly reveal yourself to me in ways that I can trust this is real and I can jump in and not making a fool of myself. And the sort of experience I was hoping for, aside from arguably what happened at that church, I was hoping for some sort of open heaven with the voice of God coming down, welcome son. And what came was eventually much less theatrical, but much more brutal. What he did is that he reactivated my conscience. And that was not a pleasant experience. Um, at the exact same time I had started to investigate Christianity, I had come to commit some really sinister misdeed which I will spare you the sordid details, but even by my own low atheistic standards of morality at the time were pretty extreme and clearly wrong. And yet I knew I had done those things and all, I had suppressed it and I had piled up all sorts of lies above it so as to not have to face the consequences. And I really had suppressed it, pretending like this never happened. And what happened at, the, at that point is that God 
just took all of this and shoved it in my face and I was struck with guilt, intense guilt like I had never felt before, a physical pain out of the guilt. And in that place of being struck with a physical pain out of guilt, there the gospel clicked. This Christian gospel that I had been reading about previously finally made sense. That's why Jesus had to die. Me, that is that he who knew no sin, became sin on my behalf. He died on the cross to pay the penalty for the sin that I deserved. So the switch that Christianity teaches is that he didn't deserve to die. I did deserve the punishment. The wrath of God was yet poured on him and I received it freely, not by any works or rituals or any good deeds that I would perform, but simply by placing my trust in him, thereby receiving salvation. So the teaching of Christianity that heaven is given for free, not by good works, but by faith, finally clicked and I received it. I said, this is making perfect sense now. God, I'm receiving this uh, sacrifice that you made on my behalf. I place my trust in you, save me. And at that point, I experienced this real spiritual renewal. All of that guilt just evaporated and I felt a freedom. I had been forgiven by the living God. So I had now to confess those things to the relevant parties and I did so. And now that everything was in the open, I figured, well, this is probably God's will now that those things are out, that I would marry my Christian girlfriend. And so I uh, left everything in friends behind. I quit my job, left my volleyball team and my music band and tried to move to New York. I found a job on Wall Street since I was working on, in finance. That worked out really well. I found a job there, moved here. And shortly after I moved here, it became very clear that it was actually not at all God's purpose for me to be with that woman. We had a terrible relationship and we broke up. And at that point, I had almost zero social connections in New York. I found myself isolated here with almost nothing to do. I had no volleyball, no music anymore. So I had my job and complete void aside from that. And this is the point where I started to try to tell to my family and friends back in France why my jump to Christianity was actually irrational, that I hadn't lost my mind in the process. And we started communicating about the good reasons I had. And I had thought of good reasons. It started to make sense. I was able to explain to them. But I was also very curious to pile up more arguments and more reasons. And so I started to study those materials that I could mm -hmm. find all sorts of lectures, debates, books. And I was going through this material every single night after the office. I loved this time in my life where I would just come back, devour this material and enjoyed every minute of it. And after a few months of this regimen of literally doing all of this, I figured if I'm going to be spending all of my time and all my resources studying Christianity, I might as well get a degree out of it. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I smart, ended up applying. <laughs> I ended up applying for seminary and I um, graduated with a master's in New Testament studies in seminary in New York City. Um, shortly after that, I met my wife, this time an American woman who was wonderful for me. And we started a family. We have two babies. And uh, I'm now pursuing a PhD in philosophical theology under a respected theologian in Europe and um, just about wrapping up my PhD. So that's in broad strokes, that's how God takes a French atheist who hates religion, who hates God, and slowly but surely breaks all of his defenses, reveals himself to him, reveals the gospel that saves, and makes a theologian out of him. And so, just to tie back into how we started, uh, you had a, a good background in science and uh, and mathematics, and now a strong background in theology, and you're you're you're, you're still a Christian. <laughs> yes, that's right. So. Uh, it's probably not the right place to go into all of the classical arguments that mm -hmm. I came to learn about, mm -hmm. but it definitely, all of my findings in terms of research for the various additional arguments comported me in the right directions. And the more I was digging into it, the more I realized there's actually really good reasons there. Mm -hmm. And so it started to be very efficient in discussing these matters with all of my atheists, friends and family, realizing that the, the gospel made sense intellectually, it was acceptable rationally, and it was also very relevant experimentally because my experience, everything cried out, the gospel is true. Mm -hmm. I was convicted, my sin was real, the guilt was real, and the answer to my guilt wasn't denial, it was forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And the forgiveness is that that Christ brings in the gospel 
not by any works of the law, not by our own righteous deeds, not by our religious rituals, but by faith in Jesus, we receive eternal life. That's the gospel and that's the best news that ever was proclaimed.